You're listening to The Foundation of Wellness, a refreshing take on diet and lifestyle with Jessica Dogert, a registered dietitian nutritionist, and Marisa Moon, a primal health coach. Hey, you guys. My name is Jessica, and I'm a registered dietitian nutritionist, and you can learn all about me at my website, jessicadogert.com. Hello, this is Marisa Moon. I'm a certified primal health coach, and you can find out more about my health coaching at marisamoon.com and all of my recipes at my blog, mylongevitykitchen.com. So today is episode 26, and it is all about caffeine, the good and the bad. So odds are you had caffeine this morning, or maybe you're consuming it right now. You guys, caffeine is the most widely used stimulant in the world. It's present in everything from coffee and tea to soda and chocolate. And I just found out that coffee is the second most traded commodity on the planet, just oil taking first place than coffee. Yeah, and in moderate doses, caffeine, it's known to increase alertness, improve focus, elevate your mood, and even reduce fatigue. I mean, it sounds like a wonder drug to me. I know for myself, I'm pretty addicted to caffeine, specifically coffee, and it's music to my ears when I hear all of the magical benefits. But scary things can happen with overconsumption. And as you're going to learn today, overconsumption is all relative. It can change for the same person one point in their life, depending on the circumstances or their disease state. And it can change from person to person, of course, depending on your genetics and more details we'll get into soon. So today we are going to chat the pros and the cons, the good and the bad. First, did you guys know that half of Americans start their day with coffee? And then when it comes to the global population, Only 10% of adults are living their life without coffee. That means that 90% of people on earth are drinking coffee. Whoa. Whoa, and over 1.8 million people have used the hashtag ButFirstCoffee on Instagram. So I think it's pretty safe to say that coffee is the beverage of choice. And the benefits are pretty impressive. So if you've always thought of coffee as a vice one that you're simply not willing to give up, I think you'd be really happy to know that it's actually a secret superfood. So according to a recent series of studies reviewed in a meta-analysis, drinking three to five cups of black coffee per day appears to be the golden ticket. At that amount, benefits include reduced risks of melanoma, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, liver disease, Parkinson's disease, prostate cancer, Alzheimer's disease, stroke, depression, breast cancer, and memory loss. And on top of that, the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston suggests that coffee may help colon cancer patients beat the disease, recover faster, and ward off reoccurrences. I mean, it sounds like coffee is the new kale, but wait. There's even more. So researchers wanted to find out if excessive coffee consumption negated those amazing health benefits. And about 500,000 men and women were studied. Ages ranged between 40 to 69 with varying degrees of consumption. So anywhere from one cup a day to more than eight. And the findings, all coffee drinkers, yes, even members of the Eight Cups a Day Club, were found less likely to die over a 10-year period. Sweet. But I also found it interesting that the same correlation is not found when we consider decaffeinated coffee drinkers. That can mean a couple of things, I would assume, that the caffeine that's in the coffee is actually playing a big role in those health benefits and correlations Jessica described. But also the way they process decaffeinated coffee destroys so many of the plant's benefits in the coffee bean. When you're removing the chemicals that, you know, create the caffeine content, you're also removing lots of the other plant chemicals that are actually a good thing because coffee is loaded with phytochemicals, phyto meaning from a plant. So plant chemicals and antioxidants that are really beneficial. In fact, a recent study just came out that said that middle-aged people who drink coffee have a lower risk of Alzheimer's and dementia. 
That may be because of the antioxidant effect, because both of those conditions are really kind of driven by oxidative damage in the brain. Yeah, I mean, there you have it. So that second cup or eighth probably won't kill you, or will it? So we'll dive into health concerns and relative risks in a bit. But wait, there's even more benefits that you should definitely hear about. So according to a recent study, working out after downing a cup of coffee may offer a weight loss advantage. So the Spanish study published in the International Journal of Sport Nutrition and Exercise Metabolism found that trained athletes who took in caffeine pre-exercise burned about 15% more calories for three hours post-exercise compared to those who ingested a placebo. And the dose that triggered the effect was 4.5 milligrams of caffeine per kilogram of body weight. So for a 150-pound woman, that's roughly 300 milligrams of caffeine. The amount in about 12 to 16 ounces of brewed coffee, a quality that you are most likely already sipping each morning, like a grande Starbucks or a large Dunkin' coffee. Oh, like the quantity. So like 12 to 16 ounces of brewed coffee is really like a grande Starbucks, you're saying? Yes, exactly. So how many of you have gone to Starbucks and ordered a grande? You know, that's going to be the size that I'm referring to in regards to 300 milligrams of caffeine in that coffee. And I think the cool thing is about caffeine is that, you know, it can offer even more functional benefits for your workouts. So recent Japanese research studied the effects of coffee and circulation in people who were not regular coffee drinkers. And each participant drank a five ounce cup of either regular or decaffeinated coffee. And afterwards, scientists gauged finger blood flow, a measure of how well the body's small blood vessels work. And those who downed regular caffeinated coffee experienced a 30% increase in blood flow over a 75-minute period compared to those who drank the decaf version. So better circulation equals a better workout. I mean, your muscles need oxygen. Cool. Well, caffeine is actually known or thought to be a vasoconstrictor, meaning that it constricts our blood vessels. So I was really surprised by the study that you just cited. And and the reason it's believed to be a vasoconstrictor is because how much has been studied on the brain. It does restrict blood flow to the brain, caffeine in particular, which might explain why caffeine inhibits neurogenesis. That's the growth of new brain cells. And also why caffeine helps with headaches because it's restricting blood flow to the brain. But studies like the one Jessica just shared show how the main effect of caffeine is vasodilating or expanding our blood vessels and blood flow. And something that might have to do with that is if a test subject is already a coffee drinker or if they only drink coffee to participate in the study, like the ones that you just mentioned, Jess, they're not regular coffee drinkers. So they actually will have a different effect because there's no tolerance built up yet. A small Swiss study demonstrated that in habitual coffee consumers, coffee does not lead to a significant increase in blood pressure. But for those who don't actually drink coffee, when they do consume it, the caffeine does increase blood pressure. It's kind of a cool thing to save, like as a secret weapon. If you're not a coffee drinker, you know it can really get your adrenaline and everything going. But just know that the results are so much different. So many studies have been carried out to determine the effect of caffeine on your cardiovascular system, but the results are inconclusive. According to so many different analyses, the most accurate conclusions are that tolerance for caffeine developed with the regular consumption of caffeine diminishes the effect on our blood pressure about 30 minutes after we ingest the coffee. And it it increases at a peak in the range of one to two hours after we drink it. And it persists for approximately four hours after. So in spite of being a widely consumed substance, um, its vascular effect, you know, the effect on our cardiovascular system in general, continues to be controversial. The effects of coffee consumption vary so much according to the individual, their specific metabolic function and disease state. There's so many different factors involved. I mean, what a relief if it doesn't negatively affect someone's blood pressure. So here's another reason to enjoy caffeine as part of an active lifestyle. 
better memory. So a study published this year from John Hopkins University found that caffeine enhances memory up to 24 hours after it's consumed. And researchers gave people who did not regularly consume caffeine either a placebo, a 200 milligram of caffeine five minutes after studying a series of images. And the next day, both groups were asked to remember the images and the caffeinated group scored significantly higher. So this brain boost is awesome, especially when workouts might entail you to needing to recall specific exercise or routines like a kickboxing combination, for example. Cool. When you put it that way, it sounds like something I would really need because my memory is just not very good. It never has been. But compared to the short-term effects of caffeine, the long-term effects of caffeine consumption on our learning and memory may not be there. Long-term consumption of even low doses of caffeine slowed learning and impaired long-term memory because it inhibits new brain cell growth in our hippocampus. The hippocampus is the region in the brain that's often impaired in people with ADHD, like myself, where we need hippocampus function to regulate our emotional responses, to help us store memories for short and long-term use, and to induce motivation. So caffeine consumption for four weeks significantly reduces hippocampal brain cell growth compared to subjects who don't consume caffeine at all. So there is something to think about long-term versus short-term. What are your goals really when you're drinking that cup of coffee? So interesting to me. I mean, it really is important to be mindful of some of the scary things that can happen when you drink too much caffeine. I mean, I think it's safe to say that, you know, coffee drinkers drink more than just a cup a day. Um, It's a great place to start. Um, Let's talk about how caffeine actually affects us when we are stressed. So cortisol, our stress hormone, is released after consuming coffee, whether you're under mental stress or not. And cortisol production is naturally high in the morning at around 8 a.m., because one of its functions is to help you rise and shine for the day. But here's the deal. People who are chronically stressed overproduce cortisol, and this actually ends up leading to low cortisol concentration in the morning instead of high. And of course, then you reach for a cup of coffee to artificially spike cortisol levels again. And when cortisol levels are high, you crave more sweet stuff, and you just really feel forever frazzled. And now you don't sleep well at night because elevated cortisol levels keep you from entering stage four sleep, which is the deep sleep that your body needs to feel rejuvenated and rested. I have been there before, you guys. I have gone so many nights without entering stage four sleep, and I kept wondering why the heck I was tired all the time, and I've shared that in some of the previous episodes because once I finally figured it out, life was a lot better. But those effects you're mentioning are actually similar to the effect that occurs during sleep after we consume alcohol. We think we're getting a good sleep just like when we're burnt out on coffee crashes and we pass out after we drink an alcohol, but we have restless sleep. We aren't going into those deep stages. So it's very important. If you're a habitual consumer of caffeine, your your cortisol stress hormone is likely going to increase more dramatically in response to daily stressors just because you're consuming caffeine. Like if the guy cuts you off in traffic, you're more likely to respond dramatically compared to if you didn't consume caffeine. So if you have difficult managing stress as it is, then caffeine is not actually going to be helpful to you. And this is a major note to self for me because that's what happens to me and so many other people. Stress just starts compounding and you don't feel like it's justified or you're not sure why you can't handle it. And before you know it, it's too late and you're just totally burnt out and overwhelmed. Well, Little did we know, coffee is exacerbating that entire experience. I mean, Marisa, when you and I decided on this topic last week and then I was so excited about it and like starting to research and everything just because I love caffeine, I love coffee, I never go a day without it, but kind of like what we're going to get into with stress and not being able to sleep, it's like, you know, is coffee really good for those who are chronically stressed out and... 
I mean, it may not be, like you said, note to self, for both of us, it may not be the best option out there. You know, in large doses, caffeine, it can actually worsen your anxiety and make it difficult to sleep. And it can sometimes actually make concentration more difficult, but really the exact amount it takes for these symptoms to kick in, it might be different for each person. And that's because genetics come into play. I found this so interesting. So caffeine is metabolized at different rates depending on your variation of the CYP1A2 gene. So some people are identified as slow metabolizers, and they may be more likely to feel the effects of caffeine at lower doses. So your friend may be able to down three cups of coffee no problem, whereas you may feel the effects in just two gulps of your first cup. Yep. Unfortunately, about 50% of the population has a variant in that CYP1A2 gene, and that gene leads to slow processing of caffeine in particular. People who are genetically slow caffeine metabolizers may not receive those heart protective benefits we hear about coffee, but instead they're the ones experiencing high blood pressure and an increased risk of having a heart attack. If that's half of the population, that's a really large group of us. So one in two of us might have trouble metabolizing caffeine. Now, something that helps us understand why our genes affect the way that we metabolize caffeine is if we discuss how we actually process caffeine in our body. Caffeine is removed from your system with an enzyme in the liver, which gradually degrades the caffeine over time. Some people have a more efficient supply of this enzyme that degrades caffeine, allowing the liver to rapidly clear the caffeine from your bloodstream. The principal liver enzyme is even abundant in rare individuals who can drink an espresso after dinner, for instance, and just fall right asleep without any disruptions and sleep like normal. But others, however, have a slower acting version of this enzyme, and it takes so much longer for their system to eliminate the same amount of caffeine. So as a result, they're very sensitive of caffeine's effects, and a morning cup will last much of the day. And a second cup in the afternoon is going to disrupt their sleep for sure. Interestingly, the older we are, the longer it takes to remove the caffeine from our bloodstream, and we become more sensitive to the sleep-disrupting influence of caffeine. Maybe that's why so many of the older people in my life all drink to decaf these days. (laughs) But um, people have really different responses to caffeine, and that depends not only on genetics like we're talking about right now, but it also depends on where you're at in your life, especially your adrenal status. Our adrenal status refers to the state of our stress hormones, such as cortisol or even adrenaline. If you're burning the candle at both ends, you're sleep-deprived, maybe you're overtrained, and you're dealing with a chronic illness, coffee could be an absolutely terrible idea for you. Other factors that contribute to caffeine sensitivity include our age, other medications that you might be taking, your mood stability, and even the quantity and quality of your prior sleep right before you have that cup of coffee. Yeah, I mean, I know for myself, I... I'm really working on like my stress levels and things like that. But something that's been so helpful for me has been just becoming more aware of how much coffee I'm actually drinking and even sometimes watering it down so I don't have that instant caffeine hit to my bloodstream. And I think one of the things I found most interesting is like, okay, what exactly is it about caffeine, coffee, tea that helps us feel awake. You know, about 15 minutes after putting down your first cup of coffee, I mean, you do begin to feel this caffeine hit that really does energize you for hours, right? It's amazing. But how exactly does caffeine make you feel alert and refreshed and awake and just ready to conquer your day? I think simply put, caffeine works by blocking the action of adenosine, which is a molecule that tells our brain to feel sleepy and tired, which it's pretty cool. That's right, Jess. In this book I was reading called Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker, a British scientist and professor of neuroscience and psychology, he spends a lot of time talking about adenosine. Now, in America, I think we call it adenosine, but over there, I guess, the British folks are calling it adenosine. In his book, I had to hear him say adenosine over and over and over. Regardless, 
I'm going to just say whatever flows out of my mouth and I'm going to tell you what I learned. He explains this sleepy chemical is there to tell us that we're tired, but caffeine occupies the same receptors in our brain, blocking adenosine from our perception. It's the equivalent of plugging your ears to shut out a sound. That's what he says. By hijacking the receptor sites in our brain, caffeine blocks the sleepiness signal that we would normally be receiving from adenosine. That's how caffeine tricks you into feeling alert and awake, despite the high levels of adenosine that would seduce you into sleep if you didn't have the caffeine. So if you're trying to stay up late into the night by drinking coffee, you should be prepared for a nasty consequence when your liver successfully evicts the caffeine from your system, a phenomenon starts called a caffeine crash, which we've all heard of or experienced before. Your energy levels will plummet rapidly and you're going to find it difficult to focus and concentrate. And the strong sense of sleepiness starts to set in again, no matter what time of day it is. And for the entire time the caffeine is in your system, the sleepy chemical adenosine is being blocked, but it's continuously building up and building up without your brain even knowing about the rising sleep pressure because caffeine blocks our perception of this sleep pressure. But we're hit with this intense sleepiness as soon as the caffeine is metabolized because all of that adenosine or adenosine is accumulated and hit us at one time. And caffeine levels peak approximately 30 minutes after we consume them, but they have a half-life of five to seven hours on average. The half-life is the length of time that it takes for our body to remove half the concentration of something. So if only half the caffeine is removed in five to seven hours, that means there's still caffeine in our system after 12 hours? Whoa. Whoa. And... I think it's really interesting that, you know, when you look at the research on coffee, if all you did was skim over the main abstracts and articles and didn't really consider any of the individual reaction, you would come away from with the impression that coffee is an incredibly healthy substance. And ultimately, it really comes down to how caffeine makes you feel. You know, do you start to get jittery and anxious by that second or third cup? This may mean that, you know, you need to cut back on the habit. And if four cups of coffee is the magic number to help you power through your day, then by all means, you do you. Just make sure that you aren't growing so dependent on it that it affects your sleep or makes you feel like you can't function without it. You know, I know for myself... I used to have so much coffee and I truly felt like I grew dependent on it. But the more I become aware of it, I'm realizing, you know what? You don't need coffee to power through your day. Maybe you just need a cup of water instead. (laughs) You know, one time I heard it explained this way. I don't know how scientifically valid it is, but it makes so much sense to hear it this way. That a lot of us look at coffee like and, and caffeine that it's giving us energy. Like it actually has energy in it that we are consuming. But what caffeine does is it stimulates energy production in our body. That's why those stress hormones are being produced because it's really something that's supposed to rev up our system to prepare for a challenge. But that energy isn't given to us through the caffeine. It's produced in our body, which really means you're borrowing energy that you could be you know, using in the future, which is kind of why it's a vicious cycle of always feeling like you need the coffee and you're still so tired. It's, it's like you're borrowing that energy from yourself. Honestly, I I think all of us Americans are like deprived of energy or, you know, like think about two o'clock in the afternoon, the Starbucks line is still out the door. You know, coffee isn't just a morning trend. And it's really unfortunate because we do need to learn other ways to energize our bodies versus just constantly giving us this caffeine crash, caffeine crash. Yeah. And it's, it's likely to become a habit for so many of us because we build up a tolerance so quickly. Also, when that adenosine chemical in our brain is looking for receptor sites to attach to like it's supposed to, more receptor sites are produced because 
they're all taken up by caffeine. So the, the, the brain starts to adapt and that's why the tolerance builds up. There are more places for caffeine to latch onto and block sleepiness in our brain temporarily. Interesting. So it seems like the more caffeine you drink or the more cups of coffee you drink over time, there's you know, you need the four or fifth cup to actually function properly. I think maybe we should actually talk about why it is habit forming. Well, in adults, caffeine enhances dopamine in the brain, um, you know, making us more motivated to, to do things and make life more interesting, frankly. Drinking coffee produces this mild euphoria because of that dopamine process and and it encourages the brain to crave more coffee. Yes, coffee is addictive, but it's only mildly addictive when you compare it to other drugs that are often abused like tobacco and cocaine. So maybe it's not like too gripping. I mean, I love my morning coffee. I do believe like what you said that you know, it brings pleasure to your brain and just makes you happy. Um, According to Chris Kresser, a leading functional medicine practitioner and the author of Paleo Cure, a well-researched elimination diet protocol, he explains that if you experience regular fatigue, insomnia, anxiety, mood swings, depression, you know, you should eliminate all caffeine entirely, even decaf and tea and hidden sources. You know, caffeine stimulates the adrenals and can actually worsen all of these conditions. But once your adrenal issues have been addressed, you may be able to add caffeine back in moderation. If you're tired, if you're not sleeping well, you have difficulty falling asleep or difficulty staying asleep, you wake up feeling really tired in the morning, or if you feel you have energy crashes in the afternoon, you're having difficulty recovering from exercise, or if you have exercise intolerance, or even if you're one of those people that gets dizzy when you stand up too quickly, or you're overtrained and you're exhausted from your workouts, or you really crash after your workouts and you're not progressing, all of this stuff, Chris Kresser points out, is what we call adrenal fatigue syndrome. The more accurate term, he explains, would be the hypothalamic pituitary axis dysregulation or HPA axis dysregulation. Chris explains that you won't find adrenal fatigue syndrome listed in the medical textbooks. And if you ask your conventional doctor about it, she or he will probably just shrug or tell you to stop researching health conditions on the internet because there's no such thing as adrenal fatigue. Yet there's no doubt that this is a legitimate, common, and potentially very serious condition. It might be called HPA access dysregulation more accurately, but Chris says he sees it every day in his work and he's experienced it himself. And it's funny when I was reading that, you know, hey, if you're tired, if you're not sleeping well, if you're having difficulty falling asleep, blah, 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 blah. Everything that I just said, I was thinking we probably just named every single person at one point or another that's listening to this podcast because isn't that why people are drinking coffee because they're feeling that way? So if you have any of those issues, coffee might be a bad idea or at least more than one cup of coffee is a bad idea. You may be able to tolerate small amounts of caffeine like half decaf, half calf is what they call it sometimes, you know, half of a regular cup of coffee, and, and something like that occasionally might be fine, but it's generally best to stay away from it if, until your adrenal situation recovers to something more normal. Now, after removing it for 30 days, you can start reintroducing coffee or caffeine in general in the form of green tea, for instance, or lower caffeine teas and coffees. But if you notice any worsening of your sleep, your fluctuations in your energy or your mood, irritability and anxiety, or just agitation when you reintroduce coffee or tea, then you'll want to remove it again for a few days and then try starting even lower again to see if you even have a threshold at all. You know, all of that being said with adrenal fatigue, it really reminds me, I assisted Lee from America or Lee Tillman and um, in Chicago, she put on a a workshop called Matcha Mornings. She loves matcha green tea because it contains half the caffeine of coffee and things like that. And she shared her story and 
with us just in regards to adrenal fatigue. And every single woman in the room was like, I have these symptoms. I'm feeling the same way. And it's so sad to me that, you know, you can go to a doctor and they will say, oh, no, adrenal fatigue is not even a thing. Whereas, like you're basically saying, you know, I bet all of our listeners have experienced these symptoms in the past. And, you know, removing caffeine might be a really good option for them, or at least, you know, removing coffee with the excessive caffeine amount and maybe going to a more subtle caffeine choice like black tea or matcha. But caffeine, I mean, it's not only going to be found in coffee, but also tea, dark chocolate, some ice creams and snacks, weight loss supplements, headache and cold medicine, energy drinks, etc. And it's one of the most common culprits, keeping people from falling asleep easily and sleeping soundly thereafter, typically masquerading as insomnia, which is an actual medical condition. That's right. Chris Crosser says in some cases that when someone stops caffeine intake for 30 days, they can completely cure their insomnia just by doing that one thing. So now... Caffeine is a drug, and like all drugs, stopping cold turkey is not easy or recommended. If you've been consuming large amounts of coffee for many years, more than one cup a day, I would even say, you may need to cut back slowly instead of stopping all at once to reduce the withdrawal symptoms you're likely to experience. You might want to reduce your intake, for instance, by 25% each week over a period of four weeks. So it might take you a month to stop entirely, but that way you ease off of it and it's not as abrupt. I have actually quit coffee so many different times, probably at least four times and for at least a month to three months at a time. But the first time I did it, I got such a severe headache that lasted three days, which prompted me to look up online how I'm supposed to... uh, expect to feel when I quit caffeine. And sure enough, that's one of the withdrawal symptoms. So I learned the hard way now, whenever I do it, I just have half of a, you know, the amount I would normally have on day one when I'm trying to quit. And then I do that for about two to three days. And then I'll switch to some kind of caffeinated tea that's lower in caffeine. And then I will slowly switch over to dandelion root, um, It's also called chicory, and you can make it to taste kind of like coffee. So that's usually what I switch over to. And that helps so much. You just have to wean off of it. So so do you remember, I think you and I both did um, a high vibe cleanse together a few months ago. And it's where we started our day with matcha. I think it was the AIP, the autoimmune protocol, the gut reset cleanse. And Mm -hmm. I remember... I'm like a coffee drinker. I drink coffee every single day. And instead, we switched to matcha, which contains half the caffeine of coffee. So definitely, if you're used to drinking coffee and you're used to getting that intense amount of caffeine in your system every morning, going for matcha, I... It's sad to say, but I had a headache because I felt like I didn't give myself enough caffeine that I'm used to, which really was a wake-up call for me in the sense of, oh my goodness, I think I'm addicted. That's such a good point because, yeah, there is caffeine in matcha, but it's not the same. Your body's still going to crave the the way that you were having it before and the quantities that you were having it before. So I guess we just learned that the hard way that we have to slowly taper off if we don't want to have those symptoms. Right. What if you're one of those people who's hooked on soda or energy drinks or even those five-hour energies? Or if you have kids and teens that consume a lot of soda and energy drinks? then you might want to just take a serious look at the ability you have to influence health and disease for you and your family and starting right here with caffeine. Because caffeine and B vitamins and other energy boosting herbs that sound really great are added to energy drinks and part of their marketing plan. But keep in mind that all of those products are filled with preservatives and artificial coloring and flavors, and they're really chemical cocktails with hard-to-pronounce ingredients that really don't belong in our system. Plus, most of those tend to contain unhealthy levels of caffeine, way higher than even the coffee and tea that we're talking about. And they have synthetic vitamins, which are difficult to absorb. And all of this is more of a shock to the system rather than like a helpful boost for the body or something fun for your kid to enjoy. 
These energy drinks can provide you with a quick pick-me-up, but they're going to send you spiraling downward and creating a cycle of dependence that's going to tax your adrenal glands and interfere with healthy sleep patterns. And scary enough, the effects of caffeine consumption during adolescence. How many of our kids are consuming caffeine here? Those effects are shown to last into adulthood and for the rest of our lives regarding a change in the chemical processes in one's brain and their susceptibility towards addiction and other unhealthy food and dr drug patterns. So what does that mean in my own words? I mean, caffeine consumption when you were a kid has lifelong effects. It's changing the chemical structure in your child's brain for the rest of their life and making them more susceptible to addiction in the future, whether it be food or drugs. Honestly, I don't even mean to laugh about this, but like no wonder why I think I'm addicted. Like I used to drink caffeine since I was like six or seven years old. Mm -hmm. um, this probably goes without saying, but often people don't actually pay attention to these things. So I just want to reiterate that, you know, you have to assess how coffee makes you feel. If you drink coffee and later in the day you feel exhausted and your energy crashes, you might think that, you know, that's actually a sign that you'll need more coffee. You know, as I said, but it's often a sign that, you know, the coffee is screwing with your adrenal function. So if you drink it and you feel jittery and kind of wired afterwards or overstimulated, that's probably not a good idea. So what you should feel if you're doing well with it is just kind of like a natural lift, maybe an improvement in mood and just a natural improvement in mental clarity, you know, and shouldn't really have a big systematic effect on energy production. Well, before we wrap up, I wanted to just mention a few things about coffee's effect on our stomach and our GI tract. A large percentage of people report that coffee actually upsets their stomach or even gives them heartburn. And this is because coffee stimulates the secretion of gastric juices in our stomach and in our small intestine. And coffee also stimulates the release of bile from the gallbladder. Now, in a healthy individual, the body neutralizes this cascade and, and everything works out and balances out fine. But in the case of reduced gallbladder function or just excessive coffee consumption, highly acidic substances are traveling through the small intestine and irritating and inflaming the lining of your intestines. So this is clearly a good argument for consuming food with your coffee, but something to be aware of is it does irritate your digestive system if you have some of these symptoms or if you have lots of inflammation there in your GI tract or gallbladder dysfunction, you know, it's not all in your head that coffee might not be a good idea, especially that black coffee. So now that we've established that coffee and caffeine can be both beneficial and harmful, how can you put all this together and decide how it affects you? Well, first of all, we would probably suggest listening to this episode again. Now that you've got it all in your head, you might want to listen to it again so you can identify if you have the traits we've listed. How many of them do you have? And that can be your telltale sign if maybe you right now in this point in your life are a bad match with caffeine. Then you can find out if you're a slow or fast metabolizer of caffeine. And the only way that we know for sure is to do genetic testing. So along with the genetic testing kits like 23andMe, these um, metabolic or metabolizers for caffeine are called the CYP1A2 test and can be ordered through your healthcare provider or even through independent lab testing companies that will actually send you something to do a cheek swab and, or even go somewhere to get your blood drawn. So if you've already done these 23andMe tests or smart DNA testing, for instance, you can actually search for the CYP1A2 gene and find out if you're AA, a fast ca caffeine metabolizer, or a slow metabolizer, which is AC or CC. Don't worry about that if you haven't done the DNA testing yet. It's just for people. In case you have, you can go look those up. You can also search Chris Cresser's website. He has a few more details on that at chriscresser.com if you search the word coffee or if you search CYP1A2. So if you're determined now to slow down or eliminate your coffee intake, then just remember to slowly taper off over the course of 30 days and then slowly add it back in to see how you respond and where your threshold is. So I think to recap, like 
the good is great, right? You know, improved memory and circulation, but I think the bad is pretty ugly. And who wants to be stressed out and just lose precious sleep and even age faster? I mean, not me. You know, personally, I do have three caffeine rules. They're really simple. The first thing I always do is drink two cups of water with like a splash of apple cider vinegar. And this is before caffeine in the morning. It's so incredibly important to stay hydrated before you reach for that coffee, coffee or caffeine. Um, Another thing I do is I like to really doctor up my coffee or tea with healthy fats like grass-fed butter or ghee or coconut cream. And this is going to allow for just a steady lasting energy. So that saturated fat is just going to slow the absorption of caffeine, which gives you even energy for several hours instead of a caffeine spike and crash. So no jitters either. And then the third thing that I like to do is just nix coffee or caffeine at least six hours before bed to prevent sleep interference. So coffee, it really is a nice eye opener for me. But in the afternoon, I really do enjoy making a switch to like an energizing beverage, just with more subtle amounts of caffeine. And something I love is mushroom coffee. A brand I love is Four Sigmatic. And the benefit of mushroom coffee is that it's regular coffee, but it's blended with medicinal mushroom extracts. And medicinal mushrooms, they've been used for centuries to just increase energy and boost brain function and rev up metabolism and strengthen the immune system. And they're also great for relieving stress and aiding sleep. And on top of that, mushroom coffee is way less acidic than regular coffee. So those with sensitive stomachs might be able to better tolerate it. Um, Another half-calf beverage that I really like is matcha. Matcha green tea, it contains half caffeine um, of coffee, but it's got three times more antioxidants than any other type of green tea. I'm a huge fan of the mushroom coffee, too. It's actually a lot lower in caffeine than the standard cup of coffee, and it tastes really good if you ask me. And uh, I love all sorts of teas, so I'm definitely going to be incorporating more of those since I started researching this episode, Jess. Yeah. And if after all this, as a listener, you're still a coffee lover, uh, a devoted drinker, then you should know that the coffee quality really does matter. You see, coffee has all these incredible health and wellness properties to it, But the big coffee companies sacrifice health benefits for their profit due to the shockingly poor production practices and import exports. These really below standard processes are not only destroying many of the health benefits, but they're actually introducing harmful compounds that can cause upset stomach, jitters, and even chemical reactions and toxicity. Most coffee companies only focus on low cost and the speed and convenience and high volume production that they can achieve to keep the lot cost low across the board. And, and other companies are focusing on taste, but health benefits are not even considered across the board for almost any company. The commercial coffee industry's production practices are designed to just make it as inexpensive as possible, and the United States has the lowest standards, so we get all the junk coffee on our grocery store shelves and for our access. And the distribution system is structured around just keeping costs to a minimum, and that makes it impossible for us to get fresh coffee on our hands that's not loaded with contaminants and pesticides and fermentation and mold toxins that are actually really bad for you. Even the healthier coffee brands tested, according to Ben Greenfield, a coffee connoisseur who comes from a long line of coffee enthusiasts and manufacturers, he explains that even testing the healthiest coffee competitors, the coffee would have, or it would actually contain half to a quarter of the content of antioxidants typically found in the cleanest brands of coffee. And over 60% of the coffee he tested came back positive for those mold toxins. That's really what the Bulletproof Coffee claim is that they test their coffee for mold toxins because they're so prominent in the roasting and drying process. These mold toxins are lurking in there, it can really drag you down. So that's why my biggest tip is really to buy organic and Arabica coffee beans, which are less likely to have those mold toxins. And if you can get them from a single origin source, that would be the best. It's just a good place to start. My coffee is always organic now. And honestly, if you're not willing to pay it, 
to, for your organic coffee, then you definitely should not be having more than one cup a day because that's really the standard you need to set or you might be doing more harm than good. Oh my gosh, yes, 100%. I mean, I love how you brought up the importance of clean coffee because like you said, I mean, the typical coffee that we probably buy is full of mold toxins. So if we're stating that, oh, coffee's so beneficial for you, it's got a lot of antioxidants and it improves your memory, well... Not if you're purchasing crappy coffee and not if you're not going organic. You know, all of those mold toxins are so bad for your brain in terms of, you know, mental clarity and brain fog and things like that. And, you know, like you said, coin coffee, Ben Greenfield, um, I think his comes from purity coffee. And just like Bulletproof, purity coffee is up there in terms of low on the mold toxin scale, too. So I love that you mentioned that. And I don't think like organic means that it's not going to have mold toxins. In fact, it doesn't. But when it's organic, you don't have to worry about all the pesticides and the fungicides that are sprayed on those coffee beans, which honestly, coffee and chocolate are two of the most highly sprayed products that we consume. So it is really important for them to be organic. Now, I guess Arabica, the region and the and the variety of those coffee beans are less susceptible to those mold toxins. And now there's other ways that they harvest and dry that help to avoid those mold toxins. And there's plenty of companies that are testing the beans to try and assure the consumers that they're lower in mold toxins. So it's up to you how crazy you want to get about this stuff. But I think you should have a minimum standard, don't you think, Jess? It's not too much to ask if you're a coffee fanatic to start raising the bar. Oh, exactly. Especially if you know, like Marisa said, you down three or four cups versus one cup might not be as big of a deal. But definitely, if you guys do love coffee, consider just become coffee snobs with clean beans. And yeah, we hope that you guys enjoyed this episode, episode 26, all about caffeine, the good and the bad. You know, we want to hear from you guys. You know, we want to know if you guys love coffee just as much as us. We want to know if you guys experience symptoms like, you know, anxiety or difficulty concentrating or not being able to sleep at night. You know, we want to know everything about your caffeine intake. So email us. My email is Jess Dogert, J-E-S-S-D-O-G-E-R-T at gmail.com and Marisa's. Marisa at marisamoon.com. That's Marisa with one S, M A R I S A, at marisamoon.com. Awesome. Thanks for listening, you guys. Bye. Bye.